An apocalypse is coming. No one knows what form it will take. The signs are definitive. Our characters believe and take up the search for the 12 guardian towers to protect the world. Some towers are destroyed or fallen into the sea, but we find the remaining ones long abandoned. Each holds an intelligent orb. But the orbs have no memory of any time they're not in a person's possession and only answer questions without speculating or offering opinions. We search all the available towers. We try taking them to nearby villages. We run out of places to search or explore eventually. Our last session, we don't even take out our character sheets. We just pace around the room, going over anywhere we might have failed to explore. We talk to the orbs and try to wring out even the slightest clue about what to do next. The DM is fixed on the integrity of the story and not handing anything to us. We declare our characters return home to wait for the end, and the DM just... lets us? Look, at the end of the day, I understand not wanting to hand everything to your player. Sometimes you have to let their creativity flow, but other times, come on guys, it's not gonna hurt you to give them a hint. For context, I had only ever played D&D with friends, and it was clown shoes. Anything above a 10 hits, that kind of stuff. We were dumb teens getting into the hobby on the tail end of 3.5. When I left home after graduating a year or so later, I wanted to give it a real go, and the man that would be our DM defined how I swore I would never be as a dungeon master. We will call this man Paul. Not his real name, by the way. Paul was at least twice our age in the group. We were all in our late teens slash early 20s. We were all leading busy lives and gathering at the local game store. And when we were all familiar, a player's nearby apartment. Now, those points of contention all happened at different points of the campaign. And to this day, the players we keep in touch with quote these and talk about them all the time. Paul was a real stickler for not allowing you to play your class as the book described, especially my wife and I. For instance, my wife played a rogue and was adamant that the only way she would get sneak attack was if not one living soul saw her before the attack. And well, that meant never, because one hide roll versus half a dozen search rolls at least, well that's hard to beat. Now the host's boyfriend at the time, who didn't enjoy D&D, who only played because his girlfriend was, he could make 12 attacks around had a pet pseudo dragon that could make at least four more attacks at level six, but we honestly enjoyed their company, minus Paul, who had a tendency to try and act like our collective dad. It doesn't work. Why? Because it just doesn't. Early on, we had gained a little bit of reputation within the capital city as people that get the job done, and it apparently drew some ire from someone. We arrived at our local watering hole to find a band playing, Cool, we thought. Love to see our local place getting more lively. Wrong. As the night goes on, you start to feel strange, tired, out of sorts. The music is seeming to put you in a trance. I slam my hands down, excited as hell. I could finally use Counter Song, the bard ability that hardly is ever used. Paul had no idea what I meant, and I said as a bard, I could negate any sonic based screwery with sound of my own, and he seemed shocked, but without rolling or having me roll, said, uh, no, that doesn't work. And when I asked why, he said, it just doesn't. To which I asked, is it coming from the band? Are they the source of our stupor? Yes, but it doesn't work. It wasn't that they were more powerful bards, they weren't illusionary, it was simply so he could black screen wipe to the next morning where we are being arrested for murdering a nobleman. Vision doesn't matter. At one point, we found ourselves embroidered in a small war. Our group had set up near where Paul exposited the battle would take place. We took cover behind large boulders and rock outcroppings near the battlefield. Our plan had been bury and disguise many large pits ahead of the battle, supplying the side we were on with the locations, and then ride out to the battle picking people off. Nope. Before the enemy army got to the pits, they stopped, drew bows, and fired a rain of arrows at our characters. Like seriously, some 300 type stuff. Where every member of this army now had a bow and all rolled to fire on us, more than 1,000 feet out. When we confusedly asked how they shouldn't be able to see us, let alone fire on us, because remember, we were behind those rocks and hidden from view. We were then told, vision doesn't matter, and he rolled the attacks. You find all your bodies. While into the campaign, we were all feeling burnt out and wanted to try some class swaps. So he proposed we make new characters because he wanted to try to change the pace a bit. A lot of us were excited, talking about what we'd play and subsequently made and brought to the table. When the session started, it was basically a short time hop, a few months into the future of the campaign, and he sets the scene about our new characters rushing into a burning town, meeting at the crossroads in the center, where we find 
all of our previous characters burnt to charred husks by a dragon that took great joy in stomping flat my gnome bard after burning him. It was about then, right there, we all decided, look, it's not us. It's you, and found someone else to DM for us. I can't say I missed them at all. Paul was especially hard on me at the table. We all came together after a week of working to not just play D&D, we'd also discuss work, catch up if we hadn't seen each other during the week, but Paul only had a problem if I in particular wanted to do that, earning me a shut up or stop talking, it's game time, despite the conversation around us being non-game related. Just good riddance. There are so many frustrating things here with DM. We had a video come out yesterday talking about problem players, but dang, I need to talk about problem DMs and how to handle that because often, unfortunately, the DM takes a leadership position at the table. When that position is abused, basically just be a dick to other players, it really, really sucks. For me, at least, the most frustrating thing is that countersong situation. I mean, I could imagine how excited a player would get finally being able to use this ability that they legitimately have. It's not a player trying to bait for advantage or using semantics to try to win over on the DM. No, this is a player who is using an ability that's built into their character sheet that they blatantly have that they're very excited to use. And then you just say, oh, it doesn't work. That's just so incredibly lame and a great way to bring down the mood for everyone. It's also a form of cheeky little railroading, which is just never fun at all for anyone. Not only does this guy cancel out player abilities that they fairly have, but also player plans. I mean, that was a good plan, putting holes in the battlefield and then picking off the soldiers when they fall into the pits. But the DM was just like, no, their magic god vision allows them to completely subvert your plan entirely. Look, players need both L's and W's, especially when they earn the latter. We've been taking turns DMing, and so this is their first time as a DM. I made up a 16 Charisma Cleric of Apollo, really having fun with it and taking the entertainer background, singing in taverns, etc. After a few sessions, we encounter a barbarian tribe, and one of the women propositions my character. The DM is leaning heavy into this and implying I'd be violating their hospitality if I refused. I rolled persuasion to get her to have sex with another party member, which ended up being pretty detailed. Rolling for dexterity and whatnot. Since I and the other player were pretty uncomfortable with this, I sent a group text saying I'd rather not have explicit funky times. Pretty please, let's just keep things PG and fade to black. Next session, we're walking into a group of people and the DM tells me that one of them is staring at my character. I'm wondering if they're hiding something. We've been sent to investigate some illegal activity, so you know. It turns out that she, the DM, has been rolling every single time my character encounters an NPC to see if the NPC is attracted to them. Just my character by the way. So of course, this NPC is hitting on my character and just won't stop, staring into my eyes, saying they want to worship me, shuddering when I touch their hand to read their palm. You mean you don't want to have sex with them? I'm feeling incredibly uncomfortable, again, and sent another group text a few days later where I basically ask her, what, what is going on? And why she's targeting my character? She responds that my character is so pretty and flirty that everyone can't help but be attracted to him. I tell her I don't want to game like that specifically that's making me uncomfortable and ask her to stop. Next session, she behaves herself. Crisis over, I think. Nope. At the end of the session, two of the other players run into the previously mentioned NPC, and the DM makes a point of mentioning that they sigh when they notice that my character isn't there. I send a third message basically telling her to drop it and that I'd already told her to stop. My question, what is going on? If it didn't mean no D&D for me and the other players, I'd stop playing with her. She has never done this as a player and of the two other players that have DM'd, none of them have done this, nor has she tried to do this with any of the NPCs. Personally, she's never been weird like that. I don't know what to do. Right now, I'm incredibly hypersensitive about the whole thing. Like, the sighing NPC wouldn't have bothered me three weeks ago, but now it's just another reminder that she doesn't understand. No means no. Much, much, much later. Hey, it's me again. The DM in question stopped that particular weirdness, but has constantly set up combats that are ridiculously unbalanced, and then gaslights us by saying, I think you guys are doing very well, and your characters have lots of options. So far, we've had being on a boat chased by three faster boats who had like 20 to 30 sailors each and grappling hooks, yay, and then a Sanhugan showed up, 15 of them. For us, the uh, level 4 characters, this combat lasted 4 sessions, by the way. 
dungeon delving where we met deep dwarves who were able to trap us in a hallway with melting stone, 20 feet wide, 20 feet high corridors, then flooded it with sleep gas. What do you do? She had told us a number of times that the only way through the dungeon was through the dwarven domain. Attacked by a flying demon on a boat. Yeah, we're really getting to hate boats. Our characters are level 5, but of the group, there is only a magical sword and dagger. The cleric and warlock make the attacks while the fighter, ranger, monk, and rogue sit around with their thumbs up their asses. Sailors are getting killed. Attacked by zombies on a boat. The zombies first were climbing up the anchor chain and then proceed to drag the boat by the anchor chain towards the coast where demons live. Then to our surprise, when our characters go below deck because apparently that's where the anchor is connected even though the winch is on the top deck. But anyway, we try to loosen the anchor and the zombies have somehow gotten down there too. More sailors get killed. We are subsequently kicked off the boat because the captain was pissed off that so many sailors are getting killed. Finally, last night, we were attacked by sirens. On a boat, by the way. I'm never getting on a boat again, as long as I live. But these were no ordinary sirens. She took the sirens from 5e SRD. Swim speed, siren song, 300 feet. Wisdom save, 14, or you move towards the creature. And added that they fly now. They fly now! No, stop it. Also, Charisma 20 save or be stunned if you are removed from the Siren Song by like plugging your ears or being in a silent spell. So of course, they stay 300 feet away. All the sailors and three of us start going over the railings into the sea. There is no spell or weapon that can even touch them. I drop a silent spell on the boat and warn everyone that we can't do it in the water, otherwise the swimming people will become stunned and start drowning. Then our NPC cleric drops a silent spell on the sailors in the water. Mass chaos as our characters try to save all the stunned, drowning sailors and the three party characters because who the hell can make a Charisma 20 save? That's pretty much where we ended the session with drowning sailors in the water, sirens now swimming in the water and pulling sailors under and attacking them, and a giant siren flying over the other side of the ship which only some of the characters can see. Players being able to do only one scorching ray attack at one of the sirens pulling a sailor under the water. Two people saving player characters and sailors, otherwise no one is able to do anything because the targets are too far away, including the ranger who spent the entire session just trying to make a charisma 20 save to be unstunned. Even better, these are apparently the sirens we passed by the other day who went back to get reinforcements and then just somehow found our boat again? This is the last straw for me. I'd appreciate any reactions or takes anyone has. In particular, how would anyone figure out the challenge rating of the siren she threw at us? D&D Wiki has CR6 for sirens with fly speed and a charisma 20 save or be stunned song that reaches 120 feet. 5e SRD has CR4 for sirens with a swim speed and aforementioned 300 foot wisdom 14 save or move to siren thing. What, do we add them? Multiply them together? For those of you in the know about the way I run D&D, you would know that my combats can get pretty freaking insane because that's the way I like doing it, especially when I'm streaming a game. However, this is crazy even for me. Like, this is not fun anymore. It's just semantics. It's just BS. It's just stun locking the players, which, look, that's not fun. It's just frustrating. Honestly, the challenge rating of this encounter, I would say, is semantics. What matters is the players don't feel like they're being appropriately challenged. I mean, clearly you feel like this is disproportionate to your power level. And honestly, from an outside looking in perspective, I agree. Look, there are many times where I as a DM feel like the players are not playing at their best. They're making poor decisions during combat. They're not paying attention to mechanics, etc, etc, etc. But here, to me, again, outside looking in perspective, the challenge just looks like super high DCs and the fact that the sirens are really far away. That's it. There's no strategy there. I guess you just hope the sirens get in closer and and beg that the dice gods bestow upon you a 20 roll for the save. Damn it, this isn't even talking about the whole weird flirting thing at the beginning of the story. What even was that? I mean, at least she stopped, but still, none of this is great. If her behavior hasn't changed in this long of a time span, man, I think quitting is the only recourse. Inspired by the story of the nine-year-old getting his character axed when he slept, I wanted to give my story of when a DM thought it was a good idea to kill my character when I wasn't present. When I was a teenager, we had a group that would play all the time. I was usually the DM, but a few of us took turns. I had recently started seeing my first girlfriend, and there was an annoyance from the DM that I didn't have as much free time to play anymore. This was ridiculous, as she also played. We just wanted one or two days a week where we did other stuff. The DM called me and said that the group were going to meet in three days, to which I answered that I couldn't attend, but they were welcome to play without me. The day rolls around and everyone shows up at my house. My brother was also in the group. Everyone gets ready and then starts looking at me as I pack my bag. I ask them why they're staring. 
we're waiting for you, they say. Oh, I'm not supposed to play the session. Me and my girlfriend are going away to X thing. Didn't you tell them, DM? Everyone goes, oh, okay. And get ready to start. But the DM goes, you can play till she gets here. I agree. And yeah, I start playing. After an hour, my girlfriend shows up and I start getting up. The DM looks annoyed. Where are you going? M my girlfriend's here. No, I will find you a place in the adventure for you to leave. <sighs> okay. After half an hour, he hasn't found a good spot. And my girlfriend started to get upset, so I declare my character leaves the mansion and starts searching the woods. He'll keep looking there for the rest of the adventure, and I'll be back for the next one. Cue a fun evening with my girlfriend. Next session, we're still on the same adventure. Cool, my character can just give up on searching the forest and rejoin you then. Whereby the other players inform me that my character was killed. Not by a monster or anything, he just like tripped on a rock and was impaled by a stick. Whereby a raven ate his eyes. This had nothing to do with the adventure, and everyone... Everyone knew it. So, I looked my DM in the eye and said, My character goes back into the mansion since he isn't dead. But everyone saw your dead character, the DM protested. Yeah, weird coincidence that another of my character's race was visiting this far west. Everyone else read the vibe of the room. The DM looked quite ashamed, and then we proceeded to play as if nothing happened. Look, I get scheduling can be hard, but that's not the way to do it. Three days in advance is not enough in advance. I schedule a week out, or we have a regular day to play the game, and then players let me know if they can come or can't come. And if they can't come, I come up with a plan. The plan shouldn't be murder your character through ridiculous happenstance. I mean, come on, it's not like our OP here left the session without telling the DM in advance. He told the guy as soon as the DM sent out the text message that, Guys, we're playing in three days, just be there. Our OP even played a little bit before leaving i mean come on they did everything they could and yet here we are with some ridiculous dm revenge that at the end of the day was copped out thank god for that so i was on roll 20 dming one of my campaigns taking place in Waterdeep back in 2017 or 2018 i advertised for some new players and had a good response one of the players was a woman which i was happy for since i enjoy having women players since they seem to be damned rare on roll 20 well, first red flag came pretty quickly. She wanted to play a 13-year-old character. I informed her that I wasn't comfortable with that and the youngest player character can be 18. She asked for 16. I said, no, 18 minimum. So she created a human fighter, young arcane archer. She wanted her character to have been part of the Waterdeep military. I agreed to that. She asked that would entitle her to stay at the local barracks. I said, yeah, that's fine. Cool. No problem. The rest of the players rolled up their characters and they were a good group. Four friendly guys who were happy to get a chance to play D&D. Everything was seemingly going fine. Players were level one and got a mission to go clear out a goblin cave. Fight happened and there was a single hobgoblin and half a dozen goblins. Not an impossible fight for five players? Well, the arcane archer decided that it was an impossible fight and she turned and ran, left the other four behind to fight. The four of them managed to defeat the encounter, but they were very salty towards the arcane archer for abandoning them. Remember, she's a former soldier, an elite warrior. Those are her words. Players finish the quest and they hit level two. Players go to a pub to celebrate. The arcane archer, however, was a bit standoffish. She refused to participate in any of the party building roleplay. If the party went into a pub, she would go off into the city barracks, which honestly was annoying as a DM because when things happened, she was rarely with the party. An NPC shows up offering a quest, she's not there. Party members find a plot hook, she's not there. She's complaining to me that the character she created, a highly specialized min max character, is not always massively effective in every situation. She also complained about how low her stats are. We used point pie. She kept bringing up changing characters, which I was fine with, but she kept changing her mind on it. I was starting to get complaints from the other players. The cleric quits because he can't stand her. I sent the arcane archer a PM and had a conversation again, giving her advice about how she shouldn't isolate her character so much, as she isn't around for a lot of things going on. Players do a couple more sessions. One of the players die but is brought back and level up to level three. She's apparently making passive aggressive remarks to the warlock. Here's a cut and paste from said warlock. Hey man, I really tried to give Arcane Archer the benefit of the doubt, but she constantly reacts to what happens to my character and talks about what happened before you or I could say anything about it. She gets happily excited when I die or come close to it. She talks over you, telling us what happens when that's something I think you should be doing since this is your game and you're the DM. I really don't care for her rules lawyering since it's your discretion and you're the DM. 
and of course, the fact she keeps throwing in my face that I died. I wouldn't have so much of a problem with that if I wasn't left on the floor to drool and then die. I truly feel disrespected and insulted that she is taking the fun and enjoyment away from me. I really just want her to butt the hell out of my character's turns and let me react to what happens to him. Treat me with the respect she expects to be treated with. And I am trying to be nice about this by messaging only you because I don't want to cause big problems between the party. She was making snide comments about his character death and then deleting them so we couldn't see them when I got online. She told me she was going to make a Clara character since this one wasn't going so well. I managed to calm the warlock down and let him know she was creating a new character, which was the cleric, because her previous character had created so much animosity in the party. She then decided that she wanted to keep her arcane archer but change how she was playing her. Fine, I was going to give her the chance. The warlock, person who was angry above, agreed and was fine with it. I had created an adventure that I am still proud of today. A noble in the city has a property that he is unable to sell because the workers who were renovating it complained that it is haunted and refused to go inside. The noble wants the players to go inside the old mansion and to verify that it is not haunted and if they do find anything supernatural to take care of it, you know? They are strictly told that any damage that they do to the property will be taken out of their reward. Once they verify that there is nothing left to bother the workers, they will be rewarded with a nice fat amount of gold. Arcane Archer did not want to do this mission. She said that we should be getting hirelings to do it. Uh, what? And that the noble was probably just not a good guy. I mean, yeah, that was obvious. But the players wanted coin and experience, which she took no small joy in chastising them for and calling them greedy? I mean, come on, aren't you adventurers? Players go to the mansion, find it is indeed haunted, moving suits of armor, poltergeists in the kitchen, eyes of paintings following them, soft whispers of their names, the whole thing. There are puzzle rooms like arranging the portraits of the former owners in proper order to open a door, Arkin Archer starts using explosive arrows, crits and destroys a good portion of a hallway and giant stained glass window. The other players are angry because, well, they were told not to damage the place and the sorcerer and warlock have been avoiding using spells that would cause a AOE damage. Well, they get to the top floor and they encounter the ghost of a young girl. Instead of attacking, the party try talking to her and the ghost girl reveals what exactly happened in the house. That she and her family were murdered by the noble who now owns the house and that he is looking for the deed to the home which she had hid before his thugs broke into the room and brutally murdered her and her younger sister. She tells them that she will show them where it is if they go tell the noble that they have cleared the house and to bring him up to her. Arcane Archer starts going off about the fact that she told them the noble was evil and bad, that she have never taken the job. She didn't really want to do any adventure and was constantly always criticizing players for wanting to make coin. So at this point, they can either destroy the ghost of the girl and get the gold for the reward, or they could do as the ghost requests. They did what the ghost requested. The arcade archer is arguing against doing it the entire time. Party overruled her and bring the nobleman into the house. Took a pretty impressive persuasive role. The ghost attacks the noble. The party engages the noble's bodyguards. They kill him. Party then takes the body of the noble into the noble's carriage that was waiting outside and dump the bodies into the ocean. The ghost girl gives them the deed to the home and now players have a base within Waterdeep. Legit though, that's actually a really good quest. I might steal that one. In between that session and the next, Arcane Archer starts sending me private messages. She tells me that in her other games, she played an eight-year-old wizard girl who had a much older bard in his 30s as her companion. She then tells me that they ERP'd a sexual relationship between her wizard and that bard, and it went on for a year during the campaign. She wanted to know if I wanted to ERP with her and I declined, stating that I am not interested in those sort of shenanigans. She wanted to go into detail about the ERP that she did as the eight-year-old, and this, of course, as a regular human being, I respond with, Oh, well, that's kind of disturbing. I'm not interested. Please stop. She did not seem pleased by my response. It, of course, made me remember that she wanted to play this character as an underage girl. Totally creepy that she seemed to have this as a... <sighs> This whole thing started off pretty innocuous, but Arcane Archer just kicked us right down into the foulest depths of hell in a single paragraph. Thanks for that, I guess. Things went downhill with her from there. After having conversation after conversation, she started threatening to quit. Arcane Archer. I fully admit, I was not blameless in this. The party's constant 
forward pushing momentum was digging into my more slower approach to things on an out of character level. I got impatient, but also I couldn't bond with the group because there just wasn't any time to do so. We go to the inn, we rest, we wake up the next day back at the house. I like to roleplay the breakfast table. I like to roleplay making my way there. I like to roleplay stocking up on my supplies. I like to roleplay talking to the group while on the way there. I just don't think I was a good fit. She literally thought the roleplay was sitting in Discord, describing for 10 minutes eating pancakes. The other players, who she had isolated herself from every session, did not want to sit on Discord for the entire session and make the Arcane Archer show. That's what she wanted. I responded, look, roleplay opportunities are there, and it's up for the players to take advantage of them. And you refuse to go to the tavern with them on nearly every occasion, and refuse opportunities to bond and roleplay. The warlock jumps in. Yeah, and you made your character young as hell, so she's not really comfortable in the tavern anyway. I don't believe she asked us about our characters like she wanted us to do for hers. And I hated how she stated in session one, I have a silvered short sword in case I get into melee and never used it until we told her to. Like, what the hell? Dude, yeah, she wanted to make a 13-year-old character. I tried warning her over and over again. You are isolating yourself from the group. Stop isolating yourself. Stop going to the barracks. Stop saying, we should go get NPCs to do our job. Stop whining in the middle of combat because you aren't uber effective. Stop complaining about your stats. Stop trying to backseat DM. Stop telling me what the laws of the town are and what is and is not permitted. At this point, I informed her it wasn't working. Her wanting to change characters every week, one player quitting because they couldn't stand her, it was just too much. She left with the following message. I want to wish the group well in your continued endeavors. I am very sorry that I have been a little obnoxious and arrogant. It's not how I tried to present myself, and I am sorry if it came off that way. I will be vacating the group, and I thank the group for the opportunity to play with me. I also wanted to thank DM for DMing. It was great DMing. Farewell, everyone. I mean, at least the ending was civil, right? I mean, that escalated so, so fast. I knew it was coming eventually, but I didn't see all the weird kid stuff happening so suddenly, you know? Everything up until that point was kind of mild. However, mild issues can, one, build up very quickly and result in somebody who is just not fun to play with, as we see here, or they can be major red flags to a bigger issue that just hasn't revealed itself yet. The weird kid stuff being that bigger issue. This is what session zero is for. You go over what you're comfortable with, what you're uncomfortable with, cover those boundaries and what can or cannot be done at your table to make sure that everyone's having a good time. While not explicitly stated, that's what we're kind of seeing here. The DM laid down the groundwork. When the player asked if she could play a 13 year old character, the DM was like, no, no, you cannot. And for a while, that's not what happened until this player decided to start trying to break those boundaries, which yeah, that's never a good sign. I mean, it started kind of mild and then it went into straight up, yeah, my my tiny child character's relationship with a much older bard. What's the problem though? Yeah, you know, I think I and the entire rest of the RPG community would like to pass. Alright, and that's going to be it for today's episode of RPG Horror Stories. If you guys enjoyed it, then please do leave a like. If you want to see more of my content, then you can check out our Tavern Adjacent podcast, where I answer your voicemails and talk about some miscellaneous D&D stuff linked in the cards. And while you're there, subscribe to Crispy's Tavern to get more of our content as it comes out. And finally, if you want to leave your own stories and thoughts, go down to the comments down below. If you can't think of a comment, leave the comment. She's not very nice to let me know you made it to the end of the video. And that's like, comment, subscribe. I'll see you all next time. Farewell.